Hello and welcome to Shift Book Club. I'm journalist and creator of the Shift, Sam Baker, and I'm really happy to be here with Jen Began, author of Big Swiss. Jen has written three novels, including the one we're here to talk about. Her first novel, Pretend I'm Dead, was shortlisted for the Center, sorry, the Center for Fiction's first novel prize, and Vacuum in the Dark was shortlisted for the Bollinger Everyman Woodhouse Prize for Comic Fiction. She has an MFA in creative writing from the University of California and is a recipient of a Whiting Award in fiction. You look like you're just slowly dying there while I'm <laughs> saying all that. <laughs> Big Swiss is Jen's third novel. Um, it's utterly original, dark and funny, and it's been described as a dark party by author Melissa Broder, utterly addictive by Gillian Anderson, and such a tonic it should be available on prescription by the bookseller in the UK. It's already been optioned by Jodie Comer of Killing Eve fame, who's adapting it for HBO, as well as starring as Big Swiss. And I can't think of any better casting for Big Swiss. So thank you for being here, Jen, with us. Um, I, just, I just have to say, everybody take a look at Jen's really lovely kitchen. Just look at that kitchen, how I've got kitchen envy. It's really lovely. And it's nothing like the house. Uh, that Greta lives in in Big Swiss but that house was based on the house you've lived in wasn't it? Yes I lived in that house for three years yep and it was full of bees and <laughs> um, we had many donkeys too um, and yeah I lived with my good friend and um, yeah the house had you know broken windows and it was very cold and um yeah, I lived there. I was broke, you know, but it was also a very beautiful house, probably like the most beautiful house I've ever lived in. So I made it, you know, it's it's not as beautiful in the book as it was in real life. And um, which is why I stayed so long. And to be fair, my friend Sissy and I would escape in the winter and go to Mexico. So we didn't we didn't winter in the house all three years. But yeah, I lived there. It's true. Yeah. No heating in upstate New York would have been like that would have been too much in the winter. Yeah, we had the wood stoves, but yeah, it was uninsulated and um, it was pretty, it was pretty cold. <laughs> well, tell us a bit about Hudson before we get into fully into the book, because for uh, a lot of Brits probably don't know much about Hudson. I'm kind of guessing it's like one of those places that uh, kind of extension of a hit bit of the city, so kind of like Whitstable is for London, which is like where where the cool people go when they when they have kids and they they need a garden and better school. Yes, um, it's it's two hours north of New York City, so we get a lot of people on the weekend, and um, it's on the train line, so it's just a two hour, really lovely train ride alongside the Hudson River, and um, so yeah, it's very touristy now. Um, it was like a ghost town in the 80s um, and um, dangerous. And then it got um, gentrified, you know, um, and it's known for its antiques, a lot of antiques dealers. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's right in the, you know, in the Catskills and right on the river. And um, yeah, I love it here. I just bought a house here, so I'm gonna I'm staying here. It seems. When did you move there? I moved here in 2016 from Boston, where I lived for five years. But I'm originally from Los Angeles, and um, yeah, I moved here in 2016 into the into the Dutch farmhouse with my friend, and um, yeah, and then I lived there for three years, and then I. I moved out and moved into a house with heat. Because <laughs> Hudson it is kind of, a, it's almost as much a character as in the book as Big Swift and Greta, isn't it? It is very small. It's very gossipy. It's very one horse, you know? Um, you, it's, it's true, you can go to the post office, say, and overhear something about somebody that you, you know, kind of know or have never met or that you know really well. and. Um, yeah, it's just very, it's pretty gossipy. <laughs> and just a lot of fun, yeah. Because I grew up in the kind of small town where, um, you know, if you bunked off school, 
some someone would have told your mum before you got home that they right. you know that they've seen you that what what is it do you think about small towns that are so such good material for fiction um I don't know, there's an intimacy, you know, you know everybody. And it's not the case anymore because a lot of the city people moved up here during the pandemic. So I go to the bar now and I don't know everybody, and I, you know, but it used to be that you you went to the bar and you knew everybody in there. And um, yeah, it was very, it's like a, a community, you know? And um, yeah, I just think it makes for, well, it made it for a good premise for, um, a sex therapist, you know, a transcriber yeah. for sex therapist, you know, so yeah. that's why I said it here. Um, and yeah, so. Have the locals read it? Oh yeah, everybody's read it. Um, <laughs> everybody thinks they're in it, you know. Yeah, of course, um, they always do, don't they? Yeah. And you know, some people are in it, <laughs> uh, granted. But um, mostly, no, you know, mostly a lot of the characters are, you know, composites of, you know, three or four people. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, everyone's read it and I've got, yeah, I mean, people seem to really like it. So I'm really lucky because if it went the other way, I would have had, I would have had to move. Yeah, I'd be driven out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I feel lucky that everyone, people seem to like it. So. What was the kind of initial start point for you with Big Swift? Because your previous two books had been, um, had featured the same character, hadn't they? Yeah, um, her name's Mona. Um, this book, this book started with, well, with, with the assault scene. So um, I was a waitress for many years and I worked with this woman who told me she was brutally assaulted by a boyfriend. Um, and it really took me by surprise because I'd worked with her for years before she told me this. And um, she'd always seemed so um, unjaded and well-adjusted um, that I, I'd assume, I assumed nothing terrible had ever happened to her. Um, so hearing about her assault, assault it just radically changed changed my opinion of her, um, mostly because it had taken her so long to tell me about it. And, um, and it's because the, the assaults hadn't held her back, you know, and it, it, um, she didn't allow herself um, self-pity. So um, she, had, she had made the experience part of her identity. And um, mm -hmm. I just really admired and respected that. And it forced me to think about my own relationship to trauma. Um, Cause you know, I've had a lot of trauma in my past um, which I thought made me all hard and tough, you know? Mm. I, I, you know, I had like a lot of bad bitch energy throughout my life. <laughs> and um, I, I just re kind of thought about it and it's, it, I, it struck me as a kind of um, wallowing actually. Um, which I had never realized. And I just, you know, I carried my trauma around with me and um, I, would, I would share it with near strangers, you know? So, um, so I started this book with the idea of like capturing these two um, very different ways of, of handling trauma and the experience of um, making assumptions about a person, you know, um, especially if they're very be beautiful and accomplished, you know? Mm -hmm. And then just getting another layer that you didn't expect, you know? So um, I also have a tendency to write about my own trauma. Um, I've led a really chaotic, chaotic life and um, I'm kind of a drifter and I never really settled on a career. And um, I've lived in a lot of weird houses and I've had a lot of stupid jobs. So <laughs> um, <laughs> in order to make my life and the choices I've made feel less absurd, um or like a total waste of time I just give them to my protagonists so it's a way of like rewriting history you know so you know I lived in the house so I used the house and I was a transcriber for briefly um, um but not at the same time that I lived in the house um and um you didn't transcribe for sex therapists 
I did not know, but um, I did subscribe for a therapist, um, but it was very depressing. It was very dark. Um, it was not sex therapy, unfortunately. Yeah. So yeah, I, um, plus I was, you know, I was pretty horny at the time of writing this and <laughs> it Hudson, shows. <laughs> Hudson's like a really horny town. I mean, there's a lot of horny people here. It is, it is really where the horny go to die as, as Om says in the book. So I wanted to capture that too. And sex therapy seemed like the best way, you know, to uh, do that. So, mm. yeah. We'll talk about the sex scenes a bit later on, but I, after I read Big Swiss, I said to a friend of mine, who's a festival booker, oh, you really need to read this book. And the first thing she said was already read it, hot. Hot, yeah. <laughs> Good, that's great. <laughs> Did you um did you kind of always intend to kind of try and make trauma? I mean, this isn't the right way of putting it, but to try and make trauma funny, or to try and inject well, humor yeah. into trauma. It's my tendency to do that. I did it in my first two books as well. Um, mm -hmm. I think. Um yeah, I just, you know, I always look for the humor in every situation in my life, you know, and to like not put that in my fiction would seem really weird to me, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's not like a choice I made. It's just kind of how I am, you know. So, um, yeah, it just I had to put some. Well, you know, and also, you know, if there's too much sadness, the the book just tips over, you know, you need mm. some like bubbles and um, it's just, yeah. So I'm constantly balancing the sadness with the humor and um, yeah, I feel like a chemist often because, you know, um, you know, too much sadness takes the oxygen out of the book, you know, and then mm. humor like helium, also displaces oxygen, you know? So too much of either and, you know, the book kind of dies. And um, in my opinion, yeah. so, so writing it's, it's often, yeah, just balancing the humor with the, with the tragedy. And, um, you know, there was a lot of jokes in the book that I had to take out because it was kind of just, you know, there wasn't that balance. And um, yeah, I, I I hated that, um, deleting the, the jokes, but I had to do yeah. it, you know? I had to let some of them go. So, yeah. So yeah, that's just how I write, I guess. So, because I was gonna, it seems like to me, I mean, it seems you always really go, <coughs> excuse me, you always <laughs> really go there in your writing. And I was I was going to ask you when you're when you're writing. Do you think about the reader? Do you kind of allow that re the reader to be over your shoulder and like, is this too much? Is this too far? Or do you just no. go with it? And no, I write for myself first. I'm trying. I you know I set out to write the book that I want to read. You know, mm. so I don't like censor myself at all. And my editor does though. <laughs> you're British says, you're American at so yeah yeah so she's like this is too much you know we need to delete this whole section you know that kind of thing um but yeah I write for myself and like a few of my friends you know that's usually who I'm thinking of when I'm writing Oh, how do you choose the jokes to take out? Because it's so, I mean, it, it's so funny. When I was reading it, I was just like, you know, doing that embarrassing snorting. And it's like, and my husband's like, what are you doing? But it's, you know, it's so funny. The idea that there's a whole pile of jokes on the scrap heap over there. It's just like. Um, it was like a lot of one-liners, you know? You don't want it to read like stand-up comedy. Not that I'm that funny. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that, but. Um... <laughs> But no. no, well, I'm not that funny in person, actually. Um, <laughs> I'm never the funniest one in the room around here anyway. Um, but uh, well, you know, there's a lot of like with the transcripts, you know, Greta like kind of has her own responses to, to um, there was a lot more of that. And it just got, it just kind of took away from the 
from what mm -hmm. was happening in the transcript, you know? It was like a little too much. So my editor just kind of, she deleted a lot of the Greta's responses to him. And I think she was right, you know? I was a little like, upset at first maybe, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, you gotta, you can't be too attached to these things. So, um, and it wasn't, you know, it's not like she deleted thousands of words or anything. So, um, yeah. So you, uh, you did it worked a bit as a transcriber. Do you, did that influence your writing, do you think? Well, did you keep dialogue uh, maybe? Um, yes, because I was a transcriber. Well, I'm kind of a late bloomer. So I went to call it, well, I was a cleaning lady for many years. And um, then I retired in my mid thirties and decided to go to college. I was like, I'm gonna go to college like a regular person. And so I was like a college freshman at age 36, you know, undergrad. And um, that's when I started writing fiction because I took like a introduction to cr creative writing course. So I started writing fiction then, and I just wrote about my, my, um, my job, the cleaning houses, you know? And um, yeah, to get myself through college, I waitressed at night and I transcribed for a friend of mine who had his own business. And it was mostly like high tech kind of um, interviews for white papers and so on. So it was very like techy. That was one customer client. And then another, you know, and there was like professors and then there was a therapist whose patients were dying of cancer actually. So it was really intense, those sessions transcribing them. Um, so yeah, I was writing fiction. I just started writing fiction and I was transcribing at the same time. And yeah, I think I think it really did help me with the dialogue. I, I mean, my, my work is very dialogue heavy. And um, yeah, you know, I had to listen carefully to these interviews. I'm not a very good typist. And I would have to like rewind again and again and again. And uh, it took me forever to transcribe like an hour. <laughs> but it was for a friend of mine and what it was $9 an hour or something ridiculous. Oh, like okay. <laughs> so um, yeah, but I think, yeah, it gave me an education and how to, you know, how people really talk. So I think it was really helpful. Yeah. yeah, because it's, you know, like you said, it's, uh, there's a lot of dialogue in your books and so many authors, even really good writers, are not very good at dialogue. That right. kind of dialogue's a lot of writers' downfall and, you know, your dialogue is really sparky and funny and even when it's not, you know, even when it's dark, it really, really keeps moving and keeps going mm -hmm. and... Yeah, that's really unusual, actually. Even in great books, it's really unusual. Yeah. Don't worry. You got to get the door or something. No, no, it's fine. Um, well, I like to, with the dialogue, I think um, it's got to be oblique, you know? It can't be too on the nose. And it can't um, just be in service of the plot. So I, I just make sure that each character has their own agenda. So they're not like kind of, so they're just kind of talking, they're not necessarily talking to each other, you know, um, even. <laughs> um, so yeah, I kind of try when I'm writing to like sit, you know, sit in the in Greta's chair and then I, I move over in my mind and sit in Ohm's chair. And it's like, I, you know, it takes a while to get right. And, um, but it's the it's the most enjoyable part of writing to me. So um, I am um, kind of tired of describing stuff. <laughs> yeah. So I I mean it just takes a really long time for me to like set the scene. You know, that's mm. what that's that's what takes the most time for me. So describing the table and the chairs and what's on the table. Oh my God, I can like really <laughs> read about that for like a long time. But the dialogue, you know, it's just, it's the best part of writing for me, so. And the, the transcripts work really well, actually structurally, at avoiding, you know, those kind of descriptive info dumps that- Exactly. You can, exactly. 
you get such a lot of information over in those transcripts it's like that was a stroke of genius I mean it was just the, I, I just loved it because I didn't have to set the scene you know so it could be just straight untagged dialogue and it was like ah oh, what a joy <laughs> so you were saying just now about being um a late bloomer I mean you had a kind of you'd written were you about 47 you'd written your first novel when you had your kind of like first big break, really? No, I was 44 when my first book was published. Yeah. Um, it took me a while to get it published, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think it was finished when I was like 41 maybe. And then it took like three years for it to get published. Um, so yeah, I was 44 and I'm now 52. And, and that uh, was the book you got the Whiting Foundation grant for. Right. So I got okay. it published um, with a really tiny independent publisher. And then um, it won a Whiting Award. You know, it was a miracle. Because um, it had only sold like 600 copies before it won that <laughs> award. And like I sold half of those because I was yeah. a waitress. So I like, I would, I would wait tables and I take the order and I'd be like, hey, but by the way, do you want to buy this book? You know, so I'd like <laughs> bully people into buying it. So I sold a lot of those copies initially, um, probably like 300 of them. And then it won the award and then, um, yeah, everything changed. I got an agent, you know, who looked at the contract I had signed and was like, wow, this is really bad. <laughs> <laughs> you really signed away all your rights to this book. Um, but yeah, so, you know, she got me a new deal with Scribner and they republished the book and, um, and uh, yeah, I just went from there, yeah. So that was life changing. This is one of the things that I, you know, absolutely love about Big Swift is, you know, Sabine and Greta are, you know, they're not 25, you know, they're, women in their 40s and 50s in the case of Sabine who are, you know, they kind of lived and they're kind of they're still a bit fucked up and, you yeah. know, it's, do you think it's the fact that you could, you've written such interesting older women is, well, I don't know, I don't think you have to be one to write one, but do you think it is to do with have, being one yourself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um well you know my the, the protagonist of the first two books is in her 20s um uh, and I was gonna write you know another Mona book and um but you know I was in my mid to late 40s at, by this time and um you know, yeah late 40s and I just I didn't think I could get the voice right I don't know how like people in their 20s talk anymore you know um uh, I do know yeah so I was like you know I think I, I gotta like you know I gotta write a character closer to my own age you know I'm just not that uh, imaginative either but um <laughs> so yeah I just um and plus yeah I don't read I don't read all that many books with with protagonists in their in their late 40s really I don't think. Well, Rachel Cusk, I think her narrator's a little bit older. Yeah. Than but that, um, that's, that's, she's the person people always say, Rachel Cusk, Deborah Levy. Right. Uh, Elizabeth Strout. And then people yeah. start to run out of ideas. Right. I think it's getting a bit better now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so it was important to me to put these, you know, older women and not that they're old at all but yeah they're just just over 40. um so let's talk a little bit about Greta tell us you know where she came from even though she lived in your house the house you were living in where tell us a bit more about her um what do I what do I say um well you know She's a version of me. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, she's, but she's a lot. She says things that I would never say, you know. Um, I don't know that I would necessarily have seduced Flavia myself without telling her I was 
listening in on her mm-hmm. therapy sessions. I may have like gone on a couple dates without saying something, but I would never have like, pulled away from it. Well, you know, Greta, Greta's like a lot, she's more fucked up than I am, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, I write, you know, I write from my own experience. And so um, like a lot of the trauma in the book's very familiar to me, you know? Um, and yeah, I was kind of at loose ends when I moved in with my friend into this Dutch farmhouse, not quite in the same way that Greta is, but um, I was running away from a relationship and that here I was in this house with, with my friend um, and there were all these bees and it was really cold. And yeah, I was like kind of trying to reinvent myself. And so, yeah, I, I a lot of Greta is based on my own experience really. The bees are kind of insane. Were they just, did the bees just move in or? No, they were there there for a reason. uh, No, my friend Sissy, she, um, you know, she went through a a breakup and she found this house um, that had been abandoned pretty much. It wasn't even on the market. And um, she broke into it and, found and then she's like I, I think I need to buy this house you know and she found out who owned it and then offer, made him an offer and then we you know and then she moved in and um, she started renovating it but then quickly ran out of money but she uh, there was a basement she's that she was going to put a kitchen in and so she had to dig out the basement and she put in this like um, concrete floor and then she wanted the rafters to be like uh, exposed, the beams. So she knocked down the ceiling and that's when she found the beehive. And um, it was like an active beehive with you know a shit ton of bees. And um, she was like, fuck it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep this thing. And um, she hired a local beekeeper to like build this little enclosure for it with like a plexiglass bottom and you could like kind of open it and see the hive. It was really crazy. So you could see the bees and here they were in the kitchen. And she was like, I think I'm just gonna leave this here. You know? <laughs> um, and we thought it was hilarious, but then the bees did in fact start dying because um, there was a fireplace right there that hadn't been used in a hundred years. And we started lighting fires in it. And I think the, bee- <sighs> the poor bees, I think we- <laughs> Probably weren't like keen on it. Yeah. So they did all die. And, um, but then they came back, not to ruin the plot, but <laughs> back at the end, so, um, yeah. So yeah, that's how, that's how the bees started. I forgot to ask, actually, normally I ask at the beginning, has anybody not finished the book in case we spoiler? So can, um, if anybody hasn't finished, can you just, just bung it in chat and let me know. Um, I've forgotten what I was going to say. I've got brain fog now. Uh, what was it going to say? Actually, I'll tell you something. I wrote this book um, <clears throat> in terrible physical pain. I think that's why there was so much trauma in it. Another, another reason. And um, it turned out I had this massive fibroid growing out of my cervix. Oh and it's so painful. So, oh wait, someone's not finished. Anyway, there's a scene okay. in the book where Greta bleeds a lot. And uh, that was me. I was like bleeding all the time. And uh, yeah, it turned out there was a, so I had a hysterectomy. And um, right after the book was finished. And um, so yeah, I just wanted to, I just want to share that with everybody. Yeah. <laughs> So did you, presumably you then went into menopause after that? Well, they kept the ovaries, but yeah, I'm at the age now where it's it's just happening anyway. Um, So yeah, I'm fully in menopause menopause right now. Or yeah, so yeah, it's hot in here, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's very hot. (laughs) Always. uh, and you've gave me all that time and I still can't remember what I was going to ask you but let's um what was it do you think 
the because Greta is kind of Greta is pretty obsessed with Big Swift, isn't she? What, yeah. Why? What is it about Big Swift apart from her Germanic voice that that obsesses her? Do you think? Um, well, she's very beautiful. She's physically. But she stunning. doesn't know that, does she? When she before? Uh, well, she... yeah, initially. Um, well, yeah, I guess it's just her voice, which you know, I've fallen for people because of their voice. Um, and um, and then she hears about Big Swift's trauma and how she handles that. You know. Um, yeah, a lot of people ha have trouble with the chemistry between them. They, did, mm. they think there isn't any. <laughs> um, but, you know, Greta gives Big Swiss um, her, you know, her first or orgasm. So that's very powerful. <laughs> um, and so I think the attraction, I think there's a lot of like sexual chemistry. And um, yeah, and, they're, and I think they're attracted, you know, to, um, I, I don't know, I, I think you like invite people into your life who like can sometimes, who force you to confront your um, past. And um, I think that's what these two are doing, you know? It, I, I, it kind of struck me that, you know, even as Greta is lying to Big Swiss and trying to remember, you know, what she does know that she's allowed to know and what she shouldn't know. Even while she's trying to keep all those balls in the air, she's, it still feels like she's being the most of herself as she's yeah. ever been in right. a relationship, that kind of balance. It's, yeah, that's right. Yeah. It, it struck me as really, when I was, I was kind of like reading reviews and, and stuff earlier, and it really surprised me how few people how talk about the fact that it's a love story yeah I know and that this is about and I don't know whether that's like a kind of a good old patriarchal heteronormative it's not really a love story because it's two women if it's you know people are everybody's seeing the stuff going on around it and not seeing right that. I just struck me that if it was a if it was a heterosexual couple people would be seeing the love story much more than they actually are Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It could be. Yeah. Yeah, I think of it as a love story for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know why. Well, yeah. yeah. I think people just focus on the, um, well, they're more focused on the trauma in the book, I think. And um, yeah, and less on the, on the love story. But yeah, it's a book about healing too. Um, and yeah, I don't want to talk about the ending, but I wanted to end on a, like a kind of hopeful, healing note. Um, a lot of people are pissed off about the ending because I think they think that they should have ended up together. But to me, that would have been totally unrealistic and um, pretty far-fetched given what happens, you know? Mm. So, but, you know, I am thinking about writing a sequel. So who knows, you know, what happens there? Um, because my first two books are connected. And so like mm -hmm. for the same symmetry, I'm thinking I might write a, a sequel. Um, of course, I have to wait to see what happens with the show though, you know? Yeah, so let's talk about that because okay. you had a 14 way auction, didn't you? Yes, I did, yes. Um, it was really crazy. It was completely insane. Yeah, I because you know the book wasn't quite finished. <clears throat> I mean, I'd handed it in, but it hadn't gone through like the rounds of editing yet, and it was leaked. The manuscript was leaked. Um, I I don't know. I don't know who leaked it, but suddenly it was like being passed around Hollywood. And yeah, then um, the phone started ringing and. Yeah, they're, you know, suddenly like Will Ferrell's uh, production company wanted to make an offer, you know, and then Olivia Coleman, you know, was interested and it, it just like spread like crazy. And then, um, yeah, so I, yeah, <laughs> it was really nuts. Um, but yeah, I, I think I picked the right people. 
um, Jody's just yeah, incredible. amazing. Yeah. yeah, and she is. You can kind of instantly see her as big Swiss. I know, right? Like it's just so immediate. But it's kind yeah. of not surprising you had so much interest because you, as Julia Louis Dreyfus and yeah. Elizabeth Moss as well, because they're such great part. Yeah, and even though it's getting better. There's still comparatively few great, interesting, meaty parts for ever so slightly older women. I know, I know. Yeah, we'll see who ends up being Greta. Um, Have you got any any thoughts? Any kind of like a wish list? It it like changes every day. Um, I I really don't. I mean, there's a lot of interest, you know, and I can see a lot of different women playing her. Um, yeah, but I haven't really settled on anyone in my mind. Um, I think Olivia Coleman would be awesome. She'd be amazing, yeah. So, um, God, what a gifted, gifted person. Um, so yeah, I, yeah. But I think they're doing the casting now. So um, we'll find out soon, like, people oh. who they land on. I'm not really involved in the casting that much, so yeah. You'll, will they send you, you know, just when they narrow it down, will they send you kind of like audition oh, reels? and? I think so. I hope so. I think whoever, I think they're going to have to do like a chemistry read with Jody. Mm. Um, so maybe I'll get, I'll get to see some of those things, um, which would be great. <laughs> I'm just so excited. I cannot wait. I'm not um, surprised. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like you said, the Whiting Foundation was life changing, but this must really be life changing. It really is. Yeah. It I really mean, hence is. the new kitchen. Exactly. <laughs> HBO. <laughs> <laughs> are you um are you doing any other writing for um, the TV? You know, I'm thinking about it because um with all the dialogue in this book, mm. it seems like it would um, be easy. So I am talking to some TV people. I've been sent a lot of scripts to study, but it's really, um, yeah, it's hard. I think it's hard to write a screenplay. It's all about structure, you know? And I can write dialogue, but I, I'm not sure how, how to structure like a television show, you know? So um, I'm studying, I'm studying right now and maybe, Maybe I'll try it. Yeah, I might try it. <laughs> oh, I do because the I because yeah, the dialogue is so sharp that they're only going to use your dialogue anyway. So they they are going to use it. Yeah, they're going to use it. But there's not enough in the book, believe it or not, to stretch for six episodes. So there's going to be a lot of. It's not going to be just like yeah. It's going to be a lot of new elements and a lot of the, the other characters are going to be more developed than I, mm. you know, so it should be really interesting. I can't wait. Um, we haven't even touched on Om. Oh, yeah. Did yes. you have a lot of fun with him? I really did. I thought maybe he was too, like, cartoonish. Um, but I really wanted to give him his own arc, you know, and... Um, so yeah, he's kind of a clown initially. Well, you know, because of all the trauma in the book, um, I needed to have like, you know, a clown just to balance the, you know, the assault scene, for example. So, um, so I made him kind of a buffoon at first and then, you know, he kind of redeems himself at the end, but he was a lot of fun to write, yeah. Um, yeah, he's one of my favorite characters. So, will he be? Well, he's he's pretty prominent, isn't he? Will he be more prominent on TV? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I think Sabine will have her like be more involved, and her dad, um, and her son. You know, I think are going to have. You know, yeah, you got to have more characters when. He's writing like a limited series. So I think Om um, will, you know, yeah, he'll be more fleshed out perhaps, you know, which is great. 
So I can't wait. There's a moment, uh, I think it's maybe possibly my favorite bit, um, my favorite line in the book is when, um, I can't even remember who says it now, but basically we're talking about kind of the aging process and how kind of this it can be. And um, I don't know if it's Sabine who says this, I'm not sure, but it basically says basically everything ages except the male ego. Yeah, Greta, Greta thinks this, yeah. Greta mm -hmm. thinks it. When yeah. that old guy hits on her. Yeah. Just like that you just so nailed that. Actually, can you talk a bit about that scene in case people listening are going, what the hell is she talking about? Because I didn't describe that very coherently. Um, well, Greta, you know, she's just moved into this house and Sabine has a son who's probably 20 years younger than Greta. And then she has a dad who's 40 years older than Greta. Um, so Greta develops a crush on the son which is all in her head, you know? Um, and the father develops a crush on Greta. So, um, but then, you know, Greta doesn't make a pass at the son because, you know, he's like 20 and that would be really creepy. But the father makes a pass at Greta, you know, <laughs> even though he's like a full 40 years older than her. Um, and this was kind of um, based on, Real life, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, and then um, yeah, there's that those few lines about the male ego is firmly intact until the bitter end, which is is mm. kind of true, right? <laughs> so true. And why wouldn't it be? You know. <laughs> I know. Um, they, you mentioned the age gap uh, with, with Greta and the boy, but the the with the age gap between Greta and Big Swiss is kind of 17, 18 years. Yeah, it's 17 years, yeah. So that's, I mean, that's significant too, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite significant, but I didn't, I have to say I didn't notice it until I read a couple of re reviews that pointed it out. And I couldn't help thinking those reviews, I'm sure those reviews wouldn't have pointed it out if it had been, again, if it had been a heteronormative True. relationship. Did you plan that? Did that just, the characters just happen that way? Was, um, what was it? You know, I write a, a lot of the book, but like the joke comes first, you know? Yeah. Um, so I didn't make Rada. Initially, she was only 10 years older than Big Swiss, but then I wanted, I thought it would be funny if Big Swiss had like a kind of a granny fetish, you know? <laughs> um, so, you know, I, ha I thought of that and then I was like, oh, I gotta make her, I gotta make Greta a little bit older. So <clears throat> that's all it was. That, I mean, it was just for the jokes, you know? <laughs> is that but is that basically is that how you approach it the, the jokes come first and then that's it totally like uh, Gre uh big swiss was not a gynecologist at first you know she was like she had some really dry job um maybe like an, an office job of some kind or i think i was going to make her a lawyer or something but then i you know the gynecologist and then she's never had an orgasm how funny is that um and she's a gynecologist and um uh, and there's a scene in the in the dog park where um i don't want to give away plot but uh um, yeah that's all right <laughs> big swiss saves greta's dog pinion and then they have this like kind of funny conversation after where greta's like do you work with dogs professionally and big swiss says pussies <laughs> cats and big Swiss yeah. said, I'm a gynecologist so yeah it was all yeah it was all about the jokes you know yeah. <laughs> that's what came first <laughs> yeah. totally fair enough I'd say um I'm sure I know that there's at least two dog lovers in the room so I'm sure they'll ask about a dog so okay. I'm not gonna um has it surprised you how divisive it's turned out to be I mean, it does seem like the most people I know 
I, and I don't know, we won't be asking anyone here. I only know, I only know of one person in the book club who has just said, oh, I didn't get on with it. Um, and most people I know absolutely love it. Mm. And then sometimes you see someone who's like, I hate this book. Yeah. You're like, really? I know. <clears throat> no, I didn't really expect that. Um, yeah, a lot of people really, really hate Greta. They can't stand her. Um, and she really rubs people the wrong way, some people. And I think it's, I don't know, it's like, I wonder about it. Um, well, you know, the negative feedback I've gotten, um, I think it's from a lot of younger people. And they, um, they seem to want like an aspirational type of novel. I mean, yeah. they don't like, they're like, why is she living in this house? And they're yeah. like, it's, it's so unbelievable. The bugs, like who would do this, you know? Like, yeah. ooh, why didn't she just move? They just, they, yes. just, they don't want to, they don't want to read about it, you know? Um, but you know, the, the details are so specific. Um, I, to me, it's like obvious it's, it's based on, you know, real life, <laughs> but a lot, a lot of people are just bewildered. They're like, what, you know, why did you make this character so gross and unlikable and, and like, you know, bad. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, been interesting. it's so, I think, I think that it's interesting you say it's, it's younger people because I think, I think it's that, the, the kind of comment, a, a couple of comments I heard, it's just like, it's almost like, I just think that they want, they just want to believe that when you're 45, you're just going to have your shit together and it's all going to be, right. and it's like, it's okay to be flea bag when right. you're 28, but it's not okay to be grown up and, uh, you know, yeah, yeah and uh, for, or to have split up or, you know, and actually I know so many women in this between kind of 45 and 60 ish who are actually this is a period of really great upheaval and you find loads of things changing and going not backwards but back to more maybe who you were and I just think maybe it oh. doesn't fit it doesn't fit with their 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 aspirations maybe right that's right kind of weird but yeah. is it weird for you when you see people getting a bit kind of like touchy about the morality of your characters it's like they're fiction it is a novel you know yeah, yeah. I don't really get that um yeah like why doesn't Greta get some comeuppance at the end people often are like you know she should be punished by the end um yeah I just <laughs> it's so um strange to me I don't know it's just not the way I read I read books. I don't go to fiction. I don't go to novels for that. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm right as, I, as I'm writing. I'm not really judging. I'm not judging my characters. You know, so also bad choices make for good fiction. You know, so yeah. You know, you want. I think you want the character to be making weird, unethical choices. I mean, I you know that's the kind of book I want to read. So. Yeah, it's been interesting. It's been really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Mm -hmm. uh, right. The questions, there's a lot of questions coming in. Um, I was going to add, there's a few questions about the cover. Um, oh, yeah. And the, the British cover and the American cover are so different. It's true. W which do you like best? I mean, I like them both. I really do. Um, the, the American cover, yeah, it's a painting. I think someone pointed this out by Anna Wyant. And um, she's a, an amazing painter. You should check her out if you haven't. Anna Wyant. Um, she, paints, she paints like a Dutch master and she's like 29 or something. Um, so yeah, they, there was like five covers they presented. And that was the last one. And the other covers were kind of like chick, chick litty, you know? Mm. Um, and then there was this cover and it's like, it's clearly the cover for this book. And I thought it was good because I wanted, um, I wanted a warning to the reader, you know, that she's, her tongue is sticking out a little bit. Um, and that to me, 
I don't know. That's like, it, it would make me want to open the book, but you know, I think it, it gives a clue as to what kind of book it is, I think. Um, so yeah, I was, I really liked, I really liked that aspect of the, the tongue. And then they, they did, they had the tongue is in the, the British cover too. <laughs> yeah. Um, which I thought is, was really good. Um, but yeah, I wanted the book, I wanted the cover to be kind of disturbing in the American uh, version, just because I think do, people do judge books by their cover and, um, you know, I didn't want it to be like some kind of pastel -y kind of blobby thing like so many books are. So yeah, I was really pleased with the American cover and I'm really pleased with the British one too. Um, yeah, I think it's just, they did a really great job. I love them both. Okay, um, Edel has said, uh, we're referring back to our age gap conversation, that younger people are put, tend to be particularly averse to age gaps and my teenagers are horrified by age gaps that seem normal to me. So I guess that could be, so yeah. there could be some of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but are they horrified when Leonardo DiCaprio continues shagging 23 year olds? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Meg's got a question about Greta's voice. Oh yeah, let me see. Uh, oh, you're looking at the chat too. That's good. Then I don't need to read that. Um. Yeah, maybe it is her voice. That's that's kind of off-putting to young younger readers. Um. I I hear a lot of like. Greta's trying too hard to be quirky. You know, that's a a comment I see. It's like they think. Yeah, she's like try hard. So um oh, maybe there's that. yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure. But um I like Greta's voice. I don't know. I thought I, I yeah. Jodie yeah. Coma likes Greta's voice, so right. frankly, it doesn't work matter what a bunch of I know. millennials think of it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, it's just, I mean, I honestly did, when I, it was, I mean, if they wasn't reviews, it was a couple of book clubs and I was just like, wow, these things just never occurred to me. Right. <clears throat> but hey, I'm old. Right. So, um, and, and Tanya's made a really good point. It's like, when do you, I, I oh, think yeah. this, maybe there's this idea that you're going to be, well, you know how it is. I mean, like when you're 20, you just think 30 is ancient, don't you? So you just think it's you're going to just be a grown up when you're 48. And when you get to 48, you're like, when is that going to happen? Right. Yeah. Now, my shit was not together at all when I was 48, actually. <laughs> so uh, I'm a little, it's a little more together now. But yeah, it's pre it was pretty dicey for a long time. Yeah. Um, yeah, Tanya wants to know where, where do I write? Well, I write in bed and um, yeah, I write every day and I write on my phone actually in the notes app with one finger because I never learned how to type with the thumbs. So it's really kind of like one finger on the phone in bed um, often in the middle of the night. So I like to wake up very early to write because, um, well, you know, you mentioned this brain fog. There's no fog really in, at 5 a.m. At 4 or 5 a.m. there's like, it's pretty clear up here, you know? Um, and then like when everyone else wakes up, that's when the brain fog happens. So I try and get all the writing done like before 11 a.m. So do I ever struggle to get to the page? No, no. <laughs> I mean, I write a lot of garbage for sure. Um, lots of garbage, but yeah, no, I just do it every day. That's interesting you say that about brain fog. So that makes a lot of sense. And it kind of feels like brain fog is probably what it actually is, is noise and the, yeah. uh, in the you know, people noise and the mm -hmm. inability to filter it out. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. 
What segmented sleeping? I was reading an interview with you and I saw a reference to segmented sleeping. I was like, what on earth is that? Yeah, it's something um, people did in the, in the olden days when they had to pack the wood stove in the middle of the night, which I had to do in the, in the farmhouse. But I, I, I've always been a segmented sleeper. So I go to bed like around 10 p.m. And then I wake up around 2. And then I do some thinking and then I pass out again. And then I wake up around four and then I write. I write from usually four to like seven and then I fall asleep again. <laughs> well, I, may, I, may, I have coffee between four and seven. I smoke a couple cigarettes and then I'm writing, you know, and then I pass out. I pass out around seven or eight. I don't know. And then I sleep for another couple hours. So I think that that's what segmented sleeping is. And it really worked out in the, in the farmhouse because I would wake up in the middle of the night and pack all the stoves. So I would go around and put wood in all the stoves. You know, you have to keep the fires going around the clock. So um, it was very useful when I lived in the farmhouse. And now it's just, you know, it's kind of a pain in the ass when I'm not writing, you know? Yeah. But, um, like, yeah, the thoughts are dark when I'm not at, when I have nothing to do, but when I am writing, it's actually, um, I, I, I prefer it. Yeah. Uh, Meg is, uh, Meg's a dog person. I thought Tanya would ask the dog questions actually, because Tanya's a dog person. Um, she said she loves how Greta became besotted with her dog. Is that based on your own experience? It certainly is, yeah. Because... Uh, yeah, I had I had Pinon. Pinon was my dog. His name was Hefo, though. Um, and I got Hefo. Well, I was a house cleaner. And he he was the dog of one of my clients. And they had a baby. And then he bit the baby in the face. Uh -oh. and, you know, I was a, I was the house cleaner and the dog would follow me around while I was cleaning. And I thought he was hilarious. And so, you know, they told me they were going to get rid of the dog. And I was like, you should get rid of the baby, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, but no, so I took the dog and I had him for 10 years and he was the love of my life and he died five years ago. And I still, I still think about him. I just loved him. So I put him in all my books actually. Um, and I dedicated my first book to him because I just was so in love with him. Still am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, so someone asked if I journal. I do journal. Yes. Do you, do you do morning pages? I do morning pages. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then a lot of what I, it's, it comes out in the morning pages, um, I turn into fiction often. So. When is morning? If you segmented sleep? Um, morning really is like four or five. Yeah. God, the discipline, honestly. Um, I forgot to ask you about sex scenes, so I'm going to wrap up by asking you about sex scenes. Okay. How did you get so good at writing sex scenes? Because that's another thing that a lot of writers are terrible at. Well, um, it was my first time writing sex scenes in fiction. I mean, there was some sex in the other novels, but it wasn't as graphic. Oh. Um, I don't know. I do. You just you, you can't you can't be earnest. Is a that's the key. You cannot write. There has you can't have any earnestness in the sex scene. So it's got to be. You got to keep it. I don't know. You got to be funny about it. Um, so yeah, I just kept that in mind. I could you know I don't think I could write an earnest sex scene if I had to. Um, so yeah, I just kind of made it kind of funny and awkward. You know. Um, it's you're not sure if it's really good sex even um initially <laughs> yeah. and you know i just put some jokes in there and um but I, you know i wanted the, the chemistry to be palpable and i hope it is but mm -hmm. um yeah it took a long time to get those sex scenes right that's for sure i had to really work go over them over and over and over again so i should have put more in there but that was all i can do so maybe in the, <laughs> in the sequel, I'll have a lot more sex, I think. 
because I enjoyed it. I enjoyed writing them. So, yeah. Yeah, it's like Meg, the comment that Meg has made about that, you know, when it's normally like really like you can almost feel when a writer is like psyched themselves up to write a sex scene. <laughs> and there is that kind of like, OK, here we go. And the yeah. language, gets, the language gets really formal and weird words that nobody ever like, uses, you know, like, I don't know. Member, he, enter, I mean. he entered her expertly, you know. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that kind of thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, none of that, so. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, Jen, thank you so much. I'm going to put you out your misery and let you go <laughs> back to your... <laughs> no, this is really fun. This, you made this really easy, and um, you guys were really nice. And thanks for being... Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. And we, we all want you to write a sequel, so... Okay, I'm going to get on tomorrow at 4 a.m. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Hey, thanks so much. Thanks, thanks. everybody.